TV, I'm Omar Badar. For 20 years, Israelis and Palestinians have been engaged in a U.S.-led peace process that aims to achieve a two-state solution. But that process has failed time and again because there has been a pattern that has existed regardless of the status of negotiations. Israel kept expanding settlements in vital parts of the Palestinian territories, making the creation of a viable Palestinian state less and less likely. So here we are 20 years later with another round of negotiations, and even though they're supposed to be secret, it has been leaked to the press that the negotiations are leading to no progress. So the question, of course, is, is there a point to these negotiations? And if there is, is the U.S. the right party to be leading them? And beyond that, beyond the diplomatic process, can Palestinians achieve better progress for themselves pursuing other means, perhaps the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, for as an example? And more broadly, given all the obstacles that stand in the way of the creation of a viable Palestinian state, is switching over to one-state advocacy a viable alternative? To debate these questions, we are joined by Hussein Ibish. He is a senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine and a weekly columnist at The National. We're also joined by Noor Araqat. She is a human rights lawyer, the co-editor of the electronic magazine Jadalia, and the Abraham L. Friedman Fellow at Temple Law School. Thank you both for being with us. Sure. Thank you, Paris. So, Hussein, just to kick things off with you, let's start with just the first question. Do you think there is a point to these negotiations that are ongoing right now? Well, I certainly wouldn't expect them to yield uh, major progress on any of the final status issues in the immediate term. I, I think we have to be very clear about the distance between the parties and the political circumstances um, facing both Israel, the Israeli leadership and the Palestinian leadership that makes that um, unlikely. On the, but, and, and I think that might lead some people to conclude, then there's no point. But I think that's wrong because, first of all, um, they can certainly yield uh, uh, incremental changes that are useful, that don't necessarily uh, get us closer to a final status agreement, but that get us closer to political conditions where you can actually have negotiations that get there. I mean, the situation is unlikely to deteriorate because of negotiations, unless they collapse completely. Finally, uh, I'd like to say, Negotiations are always important, especially I think from a Palestinian point of view, because ultimately what else do you have other than negotiations? Any, even if you combine them, if you, even if you employ other tactics, nonviolent protests, certain kinds of boycotts or others, all diplomatic moves in international form, in the end you're going to come back to the negotiating table. So since negotiations are all you have, I think ultimately, no matter what, uh, I think uh, negotiating is always helpful. Uh, the, the rejoinder would be, well, some other negotiations, not these negotiations, but this is what's available now, and I think not engaging in them is just sort of completely pointless in my view. Well, I think that these negotiations are not just pointless, but they are quite detrimental. We've seen from the record of negotiations under the terms of Oslo for the past 20 years create the conditions today that have made establishing a state, an independent Palestinian state even more unlikely. Worse than that, it's actually created a gulf and a rift between the Palestinian population itself, not just those between the West Bank and Gaza, but even those within the West Bank itself have become increasingly divided from one another as a result of the conditions that have evolved over the past 20 years, including, but not limited to, the uh, route of the annexation wall, including the establishment of multiple firing zones that are basically military zones used for Israeli army to practice shooting. And they conveniently happen to be on, uh, on top of Palestinian lands. Beyond just the issue of actually lands, however, the, uh, these negotiations under the terms of Oslo have created a diplomatic veneer for Israel to continue a military strategy of conquest and of settler expansionism and have actually afforded themselves greater um, impunity under a human rights legal regime for doing so. So I do think that not only are these negotiations pointless, but they're dangerous. What I'm not saying that we shouldn't have negotiations. We should have negotiations, but they should be on different terms. They should be those terms that actually challenge the status, uh, the balance of power between the parties, which is incredibly inequitable and quite an I irony, given that this is a very political situation. We have a stateless population under occupation and in exile against a, a militarized state, the largest nuclear power in the Middle East, the fourth largest military in the world, backed by global superpower, and yet we have have removed politics and the question of power 
altogether. So I, I think there's a factual, we have a, a, a kind of a one factual, core factual disagreement in between what I said and what you said, uh, which is that you think that the negotiation structure makes settlement activity easier for the Israelis. And I actually think that's not true. The settlements go forward no matter what. When the Palestinians are engaged in negotiations, it's more difficult for the Israelis actually to build settlements. When the Palestinians withdraw from negotiations, the Israelis feel, I think, they have more of a free hand. The truth is the settlement project has gone forward anyway, with or without negotiations. But generally speaking, except for that period between 93 and 98, where they actually doubled the number of settlers under this framework, after that, it's been harder for Israel uh, to expand settlements when Palestinians were actually in negotiations, especially vis-a-vis -vis the United States, which has actually held the Israelis back from some key areas, E1, for example, uh, expanding um, uh, some of the other sort of uh, even more strategic areas. So, so uh, I think that, you know, it, it may seem de minimis that it slows the settlement project, but it's actually a helpful thing. What about I actually, I need to agree with that. Sure. I think that... I mean, factually? Factually. Factually, okay. factually I disagree with that, and so I, I, that's why I want to intervene. Israel has uh, most recently, right after the declaration of this resumption of peace talks, declared its intention to expand its uh, 1,200 new settlement units. Yeah. And so we are seeing that Israel is using these opportunities to blatantly say to an international community, we are in negotiations, we should not be held to account, and they're dem flexing that muscle by announcing their settlement expansion. More than that, it is actually part of a structural diplomatic veneer, and I do think that Oslo affords it cover because of the terms of Oslo, which do not reference international yeah. law Let's on this question. On so, the biggest flaw. I'm, and I'm, so, I'm so, but just to the finish the thought, right. Oslo doesn't reference international law on this issue, and yeah. so according, under the terms of Oslo, Israel settlement expansion around Jerusalem, for example, has been legal. Um, I, it's has, not legal. Ha, no. Under the terms no, of Oslo. No, under the terms of Oslo, 54 so percent of the pre-existing settlements yeah were not considered settlements, but were considered Jerusalem housing units. And so nothing that the negotiations do actually counters that. Let me just finish the thought. Let me just finish the thought about uh, this idea that, that, that it's not the terms of Oslo. John, Secretary Kerry, right now, yeah. is using negotiations um, as a, a, a tool to wield pressure against the European Union, which has put pressure on Israel to end its settlement expansion by actually enacting some sort of economic boycott with those industries in the occupied territory, right? And Secretary Kerry is basically telling the EU and applying pressure on it that in order to move forward with negotiations, you need to remove these conditions. This is a structural issue. Israel is allowed to expand its settlements with, with impunity, without pressure, in exchange for entering into negotiations. Actually, I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. Um, I think if you look at the, uh, the international reaction uh, to settlement activity, Israel is not, is not allowed to do this. It, it hasn't become legal. Israel is not prevented physically from doing it. Mm -hmm. But everyone objects, including the United States. Uh, and sometimes American objections are effective, and sometimes they're not. It depends how firmly the United States draws the line. The E1 project has been on the table and approved for 25 years, and it hasn't been created, largely because the United States has said, this is a step too far. Now, I, I do think it's true that um, Israel makes a lot of announcements uh, about uh, settlement expansions, and sometimes they actually do build them, and sometimes they don't. I think it's harder um, to do it under uh, when negotiations are going on than when they're not. I, I, just, I just think that's generally just, a factual matter. But can you also the, the, the thing about yeah, framework? well, I, I agree, and I've said always said from from the day it was signed that the biggest flaw here is that it doesn't prevent Israel from uh, it, it building more settlements. And I mean, I think that's the single biggest of several flaws in in the in the Oslo framework. Um, correcting it was tried by uh, President Obama. Uh, and um, he was not able to do that. Uh, for, ver for various reasons, he wasn't able to do that. Um, and so the question is, how best do you restrain uh, the Israelis for, as a, from a practical point of view uh, at this point? And, and I think the only force that can restrain them, that does restrain them at all, um, is not anything in their domestic politics, nor anything you know, in the broader international framework, 
But the United States, when it does put its foot down, has actually been effective. It's the only thing I can see that has been effective. So this is actually an excellent segue to the next thing we want to talk about. You mentioned that um, the Obama administration has not been able to completely stop Israeli settlement right. expansion. So given those kinds of constraints that exist within the United States, mm -hmm. we can start with you know, on this question and, and go the other sure. way. Do you think the United States is in a position to be mediating this process moving forward? And is it the best player to do that? Absolutely not. I think that the U.S. has been a fundamental part of the problem. The U.S. is not only unwilling to exert any pressure upon Israel in order to stop its settlement expansion, but even when it is willing, it's demonstrated itself to be unable to do so. And that unwillingness is demonstrated time and again as a result of domestic uh, political considerations, which are understandable, but it also demonstrates that the U.S.'s own hands are tied. When uh, President Obama entered into office, he made this one of his primary goals in order to stop settlement expansion and was immediately stopped in his tracks. Vice President Joseph Biden was rebuffed on a diplomatic visit, visit to the region. Upon his return, President Obama was lambasted by his parties on both sides of the aisle who basically said, you can't do that to our closest friend, and chastised the president and gave uh, Prime Minister uh, Bibi Netanyahu more standing ovations than they did to the president in a State of the Union address. That immediately chilled the U.S.'s willingness to move forward on this. Okay, so we've seen that when they want to, diplomatic considerations make them quite ineffective, despite the fact that the George H.W. Uh, Bush administration showed that they have many tools in their arsenal in order to apply pressure, such as cutting uh, certain forms of aid, which is, by the way, in accordance with U.S. law. The unwillingness is further demonstrated by the U.S.'s own hampering of other processes like the February 2011 UN Security Council resolution on settlements which mirrored US language yeah. and yet the US was the sole veto on that right. as well and so we've that seen that the US has been unwilling in most instances and when it is yeah. as we saw early in the Obama administration it's been unable to um, do anything well it's not it's not true that it's unable to do anything uh, because it has successfully restrained uh, is some Israeli settlement activity in the past. We've, we've agreed that there are some areas which you can see would have been built on but for the United States. And, and I, I think your reference to the first uh, George Bush administration and its pressure on Israel, which was successful, dealing with the most, still the most right wing prime minister in the history of Israel, it's like Shamir. Um, so it can be done. Um, I do think it's fair to say that the issue was not handled deftly uh, in the first uh, Obama term, and I think they, they know that. Um, the UN Security Council resolution is actually really crucial here, and I think it was um, maybe a politically um, uh, beneficial to the leadership in Ramallah, to President Abbas in particular, um, to take a stand uh, on the United States over the word illegal. The, the United States would have abstained, apparently, according to all reports, uh, on that resolution if they had described the settlements as illegitimate. Even though it is U.S. policy that they're illegal, they didn't care to use the word illegal. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians insisted, based on international law, which is true, and based on the fact that the, it is U.S. policy, on the word um, illegal, and so the U.S. did veto it, uh, and they, I think the Obama administration felt extremely uncomfortable, uh, and I think they felt burned by both sides, actually, which is why they kind of dropped the issue entirely, not settlements, but the Israel-Palestine issue uh, for the last year, year and a half of the first Obama term, picked up again by Secretary Kerry. The, uh, so whatever political benefit uh, in Ramallah and in, among Palestinians President Abbas got for, for that stance and that veto, actually, I think, very much undermined uh, the idea that um, settlements are unlawful. And uh, if you, you can blame the United States for that veto, and, and that, absolutely, okay, but um, it was a, a Palestinian decision to force that hand. They knew the veto was coming, and it was over a word. They could have accepted uh, the word illegitimate, and they didn't for reasons that are completely understandable. Uh, but with consequences where, after that, Israel really felt that in an international legal framework, they'd just been given a carte blanche. So uh, you have to go back and ask yourself whether that was a wise move or not, and I think the answer is no on both counts. I don't I think the U.S. should have vetoed that resolution, but I knew they were going to. So if I had been in charge of Palestinian diplomacy, I wouldn't have put myself in a situation 
where the Security Council doesn't but the question just to, so. If I can focus well, on yeah. that particular point, right. just given the fact that the U.S. is yeah. too constrained to allow a resolution like that to go through, yeah. what do you think about the idea that maybe they're not the best ones to Well, to mediate I mean, stuff? for sure there, there are a lot of drawbacks with any mediator, and particularly the United States. The United States is um, exceedingly close to Israel in the way that Nora described, and perfectly accurately. I mean, there's, I don't disagree with what you said at all. Uh, which means that the United States is, a, is in some ways a problem mediator, uh, but there are several things to keep in mind. And first of all, um, the United States is the only available mediator, frankly, because there is no other international body, group, country, uh, power that actually wants to, to take this up. Secondly, um, ultimately, the Palestinians need Israel to agree to something. And uh, I think there, there is an upside to what is otherwise a bleak picture about the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, which is that ultimately the United States could theoretically deliver Israel, and, and, with, and no, no other party can do that. So if you're talking about getting an agreement, ultimately the United States is a useful party. Uh, it, it, you know, in, a, in a counterfactual world, it might be great to have a multilateral process, a UN process, a EU, China, what have you. That, uh, that's great. Uh, that, that, that sounds really interesting. That's a counterfactual world. That's a world that doesn't exist. In the real world, you can have one of two things. You can have either a, a flawed but, but sort of in certain ways functional um, uh, U.S. brokered set of talks um, in which, which does carry some benefits for the Palestinians, in my opinion, uh, as well as some, some problems, but mainly it's, it, it, it's, it certainly does help more than it hurts, I think, but without doubt, in my view. Um, or you can have bilateral talks just between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which we've seen. But I, I still think it's true that given the great asymmetry of power that Nora referred to, which we all agree, is, is the essence of not only the conflict, but the essence of the problem of resolving the conflict, is that you have a massive power versus a, a powerless, stateless, unarmed people. And, um, and this is a, an absurd equation. In my view, um, there does have to be a balancing uh, uh, set of powers, and right now, for all of its flaws, the United States is the only available actor, and in that sense, I would call it indispensable. I don't think you can do without it, uh, much as you might find domestic American politics very, very frustrating. Uh, I just don't see where the alternative is. Is there an alternative to the U.S., and can anybody else deliver Israel to at least agree with the United States? So th these are really excellent questions. Uh, just a few points on what you said. One, we in the discussion of the UN Security Council resolution, this idea over wording uh, may or may not be accurate, only because at the time the White House spokesperson Scott McLennan had said, "This uh, is not a matter to be resolved in a multilateral institution. It needs to be." kept within a bilateral process. And so there was inherent objection to any type of international law being brought into this or other parties, and the U.S. was insistent on that because under these conditions it can control it using politics alone, and politics, as we know, is a matter of power and negotiating have, power. And negotiating power. But however it, is, however it is, the message in the aftermath of it was that this is not a matter to be resolved in international and multilateral institutions. Right. So that's very one. Damaging. We agree. Absolutely, yeah. which also dampens so the already that. very poor record that the U.S. has established for itself over two decades. On the second issue of whether or not the U.S., this idea of the U.S. being able to deliver, even when the U.S. is not the sole mediator, which is really the issue, it's not that we, this can be resolved without the U.S., very few issues can be resolved without the U.S. Somehow, it is global superpower, so let's not be naive. But the question is, how do we then confront that power when it's actually detrimental to achieving the goals that we all share, right? And so, in this instance, even when the U.S. wasn't alone and wasn't given the responsibility to mediate when it was in the quartet, for example, it also, it also worked to I, I want to say demolish, to ruin, to, to basically make any quartet achievements impossible because of its insistence on certain political outcomes. So there we've seen, again, that even when the U.S. doesn't have the sole responsibility, it also has a detrimental role. Well, you know, and I, then, but I just wanted to finish. Yeah, I just okay, actually wanted, right. yeah. I, I, I still have to I, agree with you. 
But just to, to continue on the role of the U.S. as the sole, uh, the, the sole uh, mediator, I think that the problem that we have is that we're working in absolutes. Either it's the negotiations with the U.S. or it's some sort of grassroots, you know, power to the people type of approach. And I'm actually of the opinion that there is no single tactic necessary to move forward, but that they all have to work in concert. And whatever, whatever is going to be done in order to move forward, and if negotiations are a necessary part of this equation, a lot of thought and effort have to be put into how do we then challenge the U.S.'s role in these negotiations. And Finally, we shouldn't overestimate the U.S.'s role. When the Palestinians wanted to, they were able to garner a U.N. General Assembly resolution for Palestinian statehood overwhelmingly in November 2012. When it wanted to, it was able to become a member of UNESCO despite U.S. opposition. And we've seen now EU support for the Palestinians and where there is clear palpable sign that there's alternatives to this dead end route. It's, it's true that the Palestinians have a built-in majority in any multilateral forum, which is one country, one vote. I mean, it's automatic. And they could um, do things that are really confrontational to the United States, like joining the IAEA or the World Intellectual Property Organization. You, you want to break the Ramallah-Washington relationship for 10 years, that's what you would do. Um, so you have to calibrate using that um, uh, uh, majority in, in a very um, uh, clever diplomatic way. It's part of the mix. It's definitely a form of leverage available to us things that should be used um, in, a, in an intelligent way, without any doubt. I, I want to come back, though, to the, um, to the, uh, the quartet. The quartet is very important because you're absolutely right. The quartet, which is, which is um, the secretariat, the EU, Russia, and the United States, so basically the powers of the world, okay? And, and the quartet really was established, I mean, taking all the theoretical stuff aside, it was, it was established to give a broader international imprimatur to what the U.S. was doing in Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And everything was fine until the settlement issue broke down. You're absolutely right about that. And then the quartet was unable for the first time to issue a joint statement because of disputes over uh, the, uh, the settlement issue and the American switch on the settlement issue saying it's, it, it tried to get a, a, a freeze and it only got a, a fraudulent one which only lasted 10 months in which there was no slowdown in settlement construction and, then, and couldn't even extend it for three months. So what's no, you, know, you, you point out, and I think you make a good point there, that, that uh, what that shows is that the, um, is, is um, a, a kind of flaw in the U.S. role. Fine. What it also shows, though, is that these other actors simply, what they can do is withdraw their consent from what the Americans are doing, and that's it. It's, that's the point. As far as the quartet went, which represented everybody else, essentially, plus the U.S., when they broke down, the U.S. simply continued on its own, and the quartet just couldn't do anything. So it's not like Russia, the EU, the Secretariat, or anybody else was ready to take up the role. They weren't. They were... The only thing that they could do was just withdraw their consent. And that shows, I think, the limitations of the um, factual world we live in, in which it, it's not just that other states and institutions don't have the power to do this. They're not willing to do it. They're not sort of interested in doing it. You, you can get whatever you want to through the General Assembly. That's true. Uh, but the General Assembly has very limited powers. And I think that uh, the, the main power that they have has already been exercised, which is the upgrade of Palestine to a state, a, uh, a non-member state. And, and that's, it's important that Palestine is a state, and it's important that Palestine become a member state of the United Nations. Um, but ultimately, without um, the Security Council, you can't do that. I, I just want to respond. Let, just to be completely clear, this isn't about with or without the U.S. This no. is about how to be strategic and okay. actually balancing the U.S.'s detrimental role. And in fact, what we've seen time and again from other states is that they also need that nod from the Palestinian leadership of how to move forward. States, other states can't do more than what the Palestinian leadership asks them to do. We don't want them to do more because that would be detrimental to Palestinian, Palestinians being able to decide their own fate. Right. But this Palestinian leadership, because of being under the tutelage of American 
uh, diplomatic and economic support, has refrained from going outside of those boundaries that the U.S. has set. And that's also why. It's yeah, not just right. an unwillingness. Right. That's There's also why we haven't seen any alternatives. You're, I think you're right. There's a cost. There's a heavy cost to be paid. Because we're short on time, let's go ahead and tackle, I think, the probably the biggest question that's on the table at this point, which is the question of whether, um, given all the obstacles that we're facing right now in the Palestinian territories, the number of settlers is nearly three quarters of a million. A lot of people are just saying that a viable Palestinian state is so unlikely to come about. Why not switch over to advocating for a single, secular state, one man, one vote for all Israelis and Palestinians? What do you see as a very, very simply, it's not available. Uh, the Israelis will not agree to it. Uh, you can't convince them, in my, in my view, to agree to it. There's no quid pro quo as there was in South Africa where it was a win-win for both sides. That doesn't exist here. Um, and uh, I just don't think it's an achievable goal. It's unless you were to project many decades into the future, again, and, and have a counterfactual reality. In the present existing reality, it's not something, it's not an achievable goal. So embracing a non-achievable goal is to me you know, truly a pointless exercise. I think that it's really mind-boggling to call this not an achievable goal, even though it hasn't been tried, next to <laughs> the two-state solution, was ha which has been tried for decades, which has proven less achievable. And so it's just mind-boggling to use that as the reason that the one-state solution isn't a better tactic or a better vision uh, and a goal to pursue. The um, Dimi writer, an Israeli journalist recently in uh, Al Jazeera America, quoted an Israeli poll where 55.9% of Israelis support re uh, re resuming the negotiations. In that same poll, 55.5% of the same Israelis polled don't believe that the settlements should be uh, removed. Mm -hmm. And so we see this fundamental contradiction and this assumption that Israelis can be convinced of anything. Why would uh, a people who uh, uh, live in relative wealth, mm -hmm. stability, relative wealth, stability, with, uh, with uh, palpable privilege, forego any of that for any alternative unless they were pressured to do so morally, legally, politically, and that leverage has not been exerted on this population. So I don't think that we should really think about that's not achievable. This idea of a one-state solution has not been pursued for decades for it to merit this kind of um, absolute... Well, you have to ask, I, I have to say, political thinking always asks, begins with the, with the fundamental premise, what is achievable given the array of forces that produce outcomes? Those are political forces, social forces, economic forces, and military forces. You've got to be able to do the math and come up with the equation, okay? If something, can, if, if the math cannot be done, to produce an equation, then, then I say you, this is not political thinking at all. This is some other kind of thinking. Now, Nora, there, it, it's very interesting because um, she says it's mind-boggling to uh, right. to dismiss um, a one-state solution, even when I think it. it no, no, from, on, on the premises that you on the, uh, well, on the on the grounds that it's not achievable. Right now, my uh, response is: what's mind-boggling is to say that a an end to the occupation, which is a limited goal supported by international law, even Israeli policy says officially that it, it seeks a two-state solution. Okay. You, can, you can dismiss that all you like. It, this huge body of international law, international consensus, majority opinion on both sides wanting this thing. Okay, And to, to look at that and say, because over 20 years we haven't been able to achieve it, and we're all equally frustrated with that, I think, um, that therefore the corrective is to tackle a task that is infinitely exponentially more difficult to achieve, which is not to end the occupation, but to fundamentally change or transform or replace the Israeli state with a different kind of state. And there we leave the realm, uh, utterly, of international consensus, international law, uh, you know, uh, what is politically feasible, even conceptually, uh, and we enter into a, a realm of counterfactual fantasy, in my view. And I don't think it's useful politically for a people, a movement, a cause to um, proceed on the basis of a bunch of counterfactuals. I think you need to base your analysis in reality. I have several responses to that. The first is, I don't know about my math, 
You'd have to ask. My math teacher, the last time I took it was in high school. And it, I, it shows. I, I got to calculus. It and shows. so I think okay, that's it not, was. That's not bad, actually. Uh, well, my teachers could have told you that, but <laughs> that's not the point. So, but looking at this, I think that my math actually adds up because we're looking at all of this political support, international law on our side, a consensus that we have internationally, and failure, yeah, right. not just failure to end the occupation, but an entrenchment right. in the occupation. And so if my math is correct, unless we have some sort of right non-numbers and negatives is correct, politically and mathematically, this is proven to be a failure under these terms. Even the most ardent supporter of the two-state solution has to be an equally strident opponent to the terms of Oslo and the U.S. as a sole broker in these conditions. Well, so let me get back equally, Let me get back to the idea of a one state, though, yeah. here. So one of the basic assumptions that's always made is that if two states is this hard, it's infinitely harder to achieve uh, one state. But how do, why are we assuming that two states is not harder? Two states is as hard, if not harder, to achieve because of the unwillingness for Palestinians to police their own border, to manage their own economy, to, to have be, have be sovereign over their own trade. They'd never have a standing military. Is unwillingness or inability? There is an unwillingness. Okay. These are on the terms that on Palestinians, the Israeli side, you mean, on the Israeli, Israeli side and the American side, that Palestinians under any of any of the solutions we've seen would never exercise meaningful sovereignty, which, which begs the question of whether or not it's more realistic. And I think we should challenge the assumption that it is realistic. And then finally, and then finally, the idea, this is some, the other basic and flawed assumption, is that occupation conjures this concept of partition. There is no partition. There is no two states to speak of. The Israeli and Palestinian populations yeah. live You're in right. inextricable population centers. What divides them is the settler colonial condition that privileges a Jewish population vis-a-vis -vis a non-Jewish well, population. Exactly. Thank you so much for putting it You're that way. You're very welcome. Because, because that is exactly correct. In other words, we have the one-state solution. Do you like it? That's a, Because if you don't like it, right. the really revolutionary thing, yes. the really revolutionary thing is two states. I mean, that's the big change. All right, there's no way to take this um, a situ structure of uh, you know, separate and unequal, radical, discriminatory structure and, and occupation and non-citizenship and disenfranchisement within the greater Israeli state and turn it into an equitable democratic state for all of its That's people. That's a really I'll tell you dismal what. outcome. I, no, it, you have no it faith is, it, in, in I, humanity and in I history. Have no, I have Historical no, examples that I, have done precisely where, that. Where? This was the end of part one of our conversation because it ran a little bit long, but stay tuned at palestine-studies.org. We're going to be uploading part two very soon. Thank you for watching.